And so let's look at the appendicular skeleton. Now, appendicular refers to appendages, and those appendages would be your arms and legs, and also those structures that hold the arms and legs onto the axial skeleton. And so those structures that I'm talking about include the pectoral girdle, also called the shoulder girdle, and the pelvic girdle. And of course, these are what are going to attach to the upper limbs and the lower limbs. So looking at the pectoral or shoulder girdle, it's going to consist of the scapula, your shoulder blade, and the clavicle, which is your collarbone. Now the clavicle, the collarbone, is going to articulate with the sternum at what we call the sternoclavicular joint. So sternoclavicular joint. And the clavicle articulates with the scapula at what we call the acromioclavicular joint. And uh, we'll see these structures a little bit later. I'll point them out once again. And the scapula is held in place by muscle only. There are no ligamentous attachments because uh, mainly the scapula, you need range of motion. Your upper limb is really made for lots of range of motion. Same thing on four-legged animals. The forward limbs are, are more for mobility and range of motion where the the rear limbs are more for power and and for propulsion so uh, sometimes go to youtube and um, maybe google like a, um, a cheetah running or something like that or one of the big cats um, going to um, pounce on some prey for instance and you'll notice that the hind limbs are really working to push that animal forward. The front limbs have the agility to steer and, and eventually grab the prey and what have you. So again, uh, the upper limbs are made more for um, range of motion and mobility. So there's not going to be that rigid structure. So it's held together by muscles only. The upper limb... Uh, is attached to the pectoral girdle at the shoulder or glenohumeral joint. So again, the upper limb is attached to the pectoral girdle at the shoulder or glenohumeral joint. Okay, the clavicle or collarbone. Now this collarbone is turned so that we're looking at the bottom of it. Okay, so this is the bottom of the clavicle or collarbone. You're going to notice two ends, a flat end and a rounded end. The rounded end is going to attach to the sternum. Okay. And, and again, that's the sternoclavicular joint right here. The acromial end is going to attach to the acromion or acromial process of the scapula. Now the acromion or acromial process of the scapula is flat. And so that's why this is flat to make that articulation. So the clavicle is going to be an S-shaped bone with two curves. The medial curve is convex anteriorly where the lateral one is concave anteriorly. What that means is if we look at it from the front, from the anterior view, the medial curve is convex, which means it sticks out. The lateral um, curve is going to be concave when we look at it from the front. Concave. Think about a cave. You can walk into a cave, so the entrance dips backwards. Same thing here. This is concave, so it dips backwards. Okay. And um, basically, it extends from the sternum to the scapula above the first rib. Now, the fracture site is going to be 
um, in the junction of the curve. So it's going to be pretty much in the center. And there are going to be ligaments that attach to the uh, clavicle to stabilize it in position. So while I said that uh, the upper limbs are predominantly muscular attachment with no ligamentous uh, attachment, uh, the one exception to that is just the few little bit of ligaments that we're going to find in um, the sternoclavicular joint in the acromioclavicular joint. Okay, but other than that, all of this is very freely movable. Okay, looking at the scapula from the back, so this is the posterior surface. It's going to be a triangle bone found in the upper back region against your shoulder blade. And the scapular spine ends at the acromion process, or just the acromion. And it, you can also call it an acromial process as well, but we'll just go with acromion. Uh, that's what most of the books are using now. So here is the scapular spine. So that's a, that's a good landmark. And then it ends as the acromion. Remember I said the acromion is flat? That flat surface is going to articulate or attach to the um, acromial end, that flat end of the clavicle. And so um, we have also what's called the glenoid cavity right here. And the glenoid cavity forms the shoulder joint with the head of the humerus. Okay, so again, the glenoid cavity forms the shoulder joint with the head of the humerus. So that's why we call that particular joint a glenohumeral joint. Okay, glenohumeral joint. Okay, and then we have a couple of fossas. Remember, fossas are indentations. Well, these are some pretty big indentations. We have a large one here that's above the spine, and we consider this a fossa, this large area here, which is below the spine. So let's name it. If it's above the spine, we say it's superior. Superior to the what? To the spine. And what kind of a structure is it again? It's a fossa. So we're going to call this the supraspinous fossa. Okay, if we have a supraspinous fossa, we must have a what? Oh, one that's inferior. So infraspinous fossa. Okay, so supraspinous fossa, infraspinous fossa. Now when it comes time to learning the muscles, it's going to be pretty easy once you learn the fossas um, because we're just going to change the name a little bit. And instead of saying um, supraspinous, we're going to say supraspinatus. And so the supraspinatus muscle um, sits here. And so instead of saying infraspinous fossa, we're going to say the infraspinatus because the infraspinatus muscle will sit here. And you've heard of a rotator cuff, right? Well, rotator cuff actually has four muscles to it. And these are two of those four muscles, the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. Yeah, we'll cover that when we get to um, muscles, but I just want to let you know where they sit and how they're named. Let's look at some other structures here. We have the superior angle. We have the inferior angle. In the superior angle, as we come down here to this superior border, we're going to have a notch that's called the scapular notch, and that's where a neurovascular bundle will go through to innervate these muscles. Work this edge right here is the medial or vertebral border, so that points medially. Over here is the lateral or axillary border. Remember, axillary means armpit, so it's going to aim toward the armpit. Um, but again, this is um, the lateral or axillary border. And of course, 
you can see the glenoid cavity again right here. And so that's where your humerus or upper arm attaches. And so obviously that would have to be laterally. Okay. You're not going to have that facing medially. Although if it did face medially, you could probably get to those, those little hard to reach itches on your back, right? Okay. But, but you wouldn't be able to do much else with it. So, um, again, think about it logically. Your arm attaches here. The arm is going to have to be lateral. So this is your lateral border. This is your medial border. Okay, let's turn it around and look at the anterior view. Okay, this is the anterior or front view. Now, if you're looking at a full skeleton, you're not really going to see this very well. You're going to have to peek through the ribs to see this because this area right here is right up against the rib cage. Okay, and what I'm pointing to again is another fossa. This is the subscapular fossa. Now it says here it's filled with muscle. The muscle that it's filled with is the subscapularis muscle. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing a pattern here. So the subscapularis muscle sits right there. And guess what? That's the third muscle of the four rotator cuff muscles that you'll be learning. So there you go. If you got a head start and the fourth rotator cuff muscle well, you'll have to stay tuned for the muscle lectures. All right, another thing it has is this thing called the coracoid process. Now, this is kind of difficult uh, because in the skeleton, we have a coracoid, a coronoid, and a conoid. Okay, now I actually kind of missed the conoid. And so I'm going to back up just a bit here. Here is the conoid tubercle. I wanted to wait until we saw the coracoid process just to come back here though to the clavicle because this is the conoid. I think of Conan the Barbarian, except I call it conoid the Barbarian. You know, he's like, I've got the big clavicles. Yeah. Okay. So conoid the Barbarian with big clavicles. Okay, so that's our conoid. This is our coracoid. And you can think of it because it's almost C-shaped. Okay, backwards C. How I kind of think of it, though, it's like a cobra. Okay. And you have two scapulas, right? So you have CC, or cobra cobra. And so, again, this is the cora coid process see cora coid two c's so cobra and then you have a second one cobra so there's two so again we have our conoid tubercle and our coracoid process okay and then the other parts again you have the lateral um, or axillary border. You have the medial or vertebral border. The inferior angle, superior angle, superior border, scapular notch, glenoid cavity. Here you can see the acromion. Here's the area of the acromion that's going to attach to the clavicle. Again, to give you the um, acromioclavicular joint. Now, have you ever heard about like a shoulder dislocation or a shoulder separation? Well, let me tell you what the difference is. In a shoulder separation, it's the acromioclavicular joint that the, the ligaments um, get tore or, or actually broke apart altogether, depending on the severity of it. But uh, we would call that an AC tear. And that would give you a shoulder separation. Okay. Especially if it's cut all the way through. That would give you a shoulder separation. If the glenohumeral joint pops out of the scapula, that is a shoulder dislocation. See the difference? Shoulder dislocation, glenohumeral joint, 
shoulder separation, a chromioclavicular joint. Okay. Okay, so the upper extremity, each upper limb has 30 bones. The humerus within the arm. So here's the humerus. Why do we call it humerus? Because it's attached to your funny bone. Okay, I know. Not very humerus. And then um, we have the ulna and the radius in the forearm. Oh, and by the way, uh, think about that for a second. Usually if we hear the word arm, we think about this whole thing. In anatomy, we refer to this as the arm and this is the forearm. Okay. And uh, the radius is on your thumb side. And the ulna is on your little finger side. And you could think about it this way. Little finger has an L in it. Ulna has an L in it. Okay. And then um, in the wrist, we have carpal bones. And then in the palm, see, these look like fingers, but they're not. This is in the palm. These are the metacarpals. And then your fingers are the phalanges. Now the joints, again, this is a little bit of a review, but the joints, we have the glenohumeral joint. Okay, I don't know if you've heard of one of these, an elbow joint. Yeah, of course you have. So an elbow joint. Down here is the wrist joint. And then we have what's called the metacarpal phalangeal joint. Metacarpal phalangeal, or MCP joint metacarpal phalangeal mcp and then we have our interphalangeal joints now this one is closer to the body so we're going to call this the proximal interphalangeal joint so that is a what that's a pip and then so this is a distal interphalangeal joint so we call that a dip. So you have your dips, your pips, and your MCPs. Again, this MCP, this is like if you make a fist and you see those knuckles, that's the metacarpal phalangeal joints or the MCPs. So again, uh, dips, pips, MCPs. Okay. And so the proximal end of the humerus is going to be part of the shoulder joint. Now we have the head and what's usually attached to a head? What's attached to your head? A neck, right? And so actually the humerus has two necks. We have the head, we have the anatomical neck, and then down here we have the surgical neck. And we'll talk more about the surgical neck in a little bit. But then we have these tubercles. We have the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle. The lesser tubercle is going to be more anterior than the greater tubercle. But in between the tubercles is going to be a depression or a sulcus. So again, that's how you remember a sulcus is a depression. Because if you're depressed, what do you do? You sulk. Okay, um, so it's basically a groove. And as a matter of fact, we have another name for it that uses the term groove. But first, let's talk about this. Um, this is the intertubecular sulcus. Intertubecular sulcus. Again, think about what's that road that goes in between states? It's an interstate. Well, this is between two tubercles, so it's intertubecular. And it's a depression, so it's a sulcus. But what goes through here is one of the bicep tendons. And so we can also call this the bicipital groove. Okay, so bicipital groove. All right. And then we get down to the surgical neck. Why do we call it the surgical neck? Because this is the area most likely to fracture. If the humerus fractures, this is where it's most likely going to fracture. Of course, it could fracture anywhere along the, the shaft or the head or anything. But 
you know, statistically, this is where it's most likely going to fracture. And then we have a roughened area that's called the deltoid tuberosity for attachment of the deltoid muscle. And then, of course, we have the, the shaft of the uh, humerus. Okay, so once again, head, anatomical neck, greater tubercle, lesser tubercle, intertrabecular sulcus or bicipital groove, surgical neck, shaft. Now take a look at this. This is an x-ray of osteoarthritis. Now this is the humerus. This is the head of the humerus, which should be quite a bit more round than this. Okay, it's getting kind of worn away. Also, right here is the glenohumeral joint. And there should be some uh, hyaline cartilage in there on both of these. So there should look like there's more of a gap than what we see here, which means a lot of that cartilage is worn away. Now that's going to irritate the bone. And when bone gets irritated, it starts to grow more bone. And so that's what we have here is this bone spur. We call that an osteophyte. Okay, so an osteophyte. And let's see if we can pick out some of the other structures here. What structure is this? Okay, almost looks like a little snake head, doesn't it? Oh, what was our snake head? Oh, a cobra. We have two cobras, right? CC, cobra, cobra. So coracoid process. Right here, you can see the clavicle. Right here, a little hard to see. But that is the um, acromion. And so right in here is the chromioclavicular joint. Okay, but the rest of this is the clavicle. The sternoclavicular joint, kind of hard to see here. But you can see the lateral border of the clavicle. So there's the lateral border. Hard to see the medial border, but it's in there. It's about right there. Okay. Now looking at the distal end, this is going to form the elbow joint with the ulna and the radius. Now, technically, these are condyles. Technically. Okay. So what would we call these areas right here that are above the condyles? Well, what's that uh, structure that's above your dermis? We have the epidermis. These are above the condyles, so we call these the epicondyles. Okay. And so this is a lateral epicondyle, and this is a medial epicondyle. All right, and I'll tell you how to tell the difference in just a moment. But again, technically these are condyles, but because they have a unique shape to them and a unique function, um, we're going to give them specific names. This part right here is round like a head. And what do you put on your head? You put a cap. Actually, capit means head. Like you've heard of the term decapitate. That means to remove a head. Okay. Capit means head. So we call this the capitulum which articulates with the head of the radius. So again, this is round like a head, a caput, so capitulum. And again, it's going to attach here. Now, this is the head of um, the radius. If we look at it kind of head on, this is going to be round. You know, think about what do you measure on, a, on something round besides a circumference and um, a diameter, you would measure a radius. So we call this the radius. This is going to allow for rotation of this back and forth, but also movement up and down. So like if you're bending your elbow, it's going to ride along there. If you're uh, rotating your hand to look at the back of your hand and the palm of the hand back and forth, this is going to rotate on this as well. Okay. Now here we have what's called uh, the trochlea. 
Trochlea means pulley, and this is kind of pulley shaped. And this is going to articulate with the ulna. Okay. Now, uh, they're talking about the olecranon fossa. Um, it's the posterior depression of the olecranon process of the ulna. We'll get into that in just a second. Um, I talked about the medial and lateral epicondyles again. This is the lateral epicondyle because the radius is on the thumb side. Think about anatomical position. Anatomical position, you have your palms forward. The thumbs are sticking out laterally. That's how you know that the radius, which is on the thumb side, and if the thumbs are sticking out laterally, that's your lateral epicondyle. The ulna is on your little finger side. In anatomical position, your little finger is pointing medially. So this is the medial epicondyle. And again, this is attachment point um, for forearm muscles. And occasionally these can, these can become irritated. So you can get what's called a lateral epicondylitis or a medial epicondylitis. So medial epicondylitis is known as golfer's elbow. It's also known as baseball elbow as well, but uh, golfer's elbow. So that a lot of times um, becomes irritated uh, when um, uh, playing golf. And lateral epicondylitis is known as tennis elbow. Okay. All right. So let's go back to the fossas. But first, let's learn a little bit about uh, the radius and the ulna. Okay, the ulna, again, is on the little finger side. And um, this is the ulna. This is an anterior view. This is a posterior view. And we have what's called the trochlear notch. Trochlear notch is going to fit up against the trochlea. We also have a radial notch. And this is where the head of the radius fits in, as you can see here. And then the point of your elbow, remember we kind of talked this about this before, where you hit your elbow and then you say, oh, lecranon. That's the olecranon process. So that's the point of your elbow. Okay, so this right here is the point of your elbow, the olecranon process. Right here is the point of your elbow, olecranon process. Okay, the radius on the thumb side, the head articulates with the capitulum. Here's the capitulum. Here's the head of the radius. And at the radial notch of the ulna, which you can see right here. And there's going to be a tuberosity for muscle attachment. So this is the radial tuberosity. Okay, so radial tuberosity. Okay, now look at the shape of this. Um, and there's one other uh, structure I'm going to show you in just a moment. So notice that you have kind of a point here. Again, that's your olecranon process. And let's go back to, you smacked your elbow, you said, oh, olecranon. Okay, now you're annoyed. You're not just annoyed, you are coronoid. So here's your coronoid process, one of them. You also have another coronoid process in the jaw. So look that up. Um, think about uh, chewing on something hard and you bite into it and now your tooth hurts and your jaw hurts and you're not just annoyed, you're coronoid. Okay, so that's our, our three different processes. The coronoid process the conoid, which is in the clavicle, and the coracoid process, which is in the scapula. So hopefully you remember those apart from one another. Okay, but going back to this, the olecranon process has a point, the coracoid process has a point. So it would be difficult to totally straighten out the elbow or totally bend the elbow with these points in the way. So we're going to make a depression or a fossa 
to accommodate, here's the coracoid process right here, or I'm sorry, coronoid process. I'm back to thinking about the scapula again. So here's the coronoid process. And as you bend your elbow, that coronoid process goes into the coronoid fossa. When you straighten your elbow, the olecranon process is going to go into this fossa, which is the olecranon fossa. Okay. So I hope that helps. So the elbow joint is the articulation of the humerus with the ulna and the radius. The ulna again articulates with the trochlea of the humerus. The radius articulates with the capitulum of the humerus. And in between the radius and the ulna, we have this very tough membrane. It's called the inner osseous membrane. And that's going to have a couple of functions. Uh, one, it's the site for muscle attachment, but two, it also prevents the radius and the ulna from shearing apart. Okay, so it's gonna keep them together. And uh, it's gonna give it some stability and rigidity somewhat, although it's going to be flexible, which means I can rotate this radius around the ulna is not going to rotate by the way when you pronate and supinate your hand in other words supinate the palm is up think about it this way if i hand you a bowl of soup you're not going to balance it on the back of your hand right you're going to put your palm up and take the bowl of soup pronate is where the back of your hand is showing i think a pronate is your knuckles are now prone to getting smacked by a ruler Okay, so um, supination, you can hold a bowl of soup. Pronation, your knuckles are exposed to getting and prone to getting smacked. Okay, so this allows for flexibility for pronation and supination since it's the radius that's creating that movement. And the ulna is, is staying, you know, pretty... Um, uh, fixed in place. And so let's look at the distal end of the ulna and the radius. And this is a little confusing, so you got to kind of get this in your head um, and again look at some pictures of the whole bone together. But uh, remember how the ulna had that olecranon process, it was a little bigger and bulkier and pointy? Well, the opposite end by the wrist is actually smaller. And remember up in the elbow that the radius had the nice small round uh, head, you know, that could rotate. Well, down by the wrist, that's going to be much larger and bulkier. So they're kind of opposite uh, when you get down to the, the wrist. Radius gets bulkier, the ulna gets smaller. So the ulna, we have a styloid process right here and um, the head is separated from the wrist joint by a fibrocartilage disc okay we call that the umt joint and that stands for ulno meniscal triquetral joint so the umt joint and when you look at it on x-ray it looks like there's a big gap right there almost looks like uh, some of the wrist is dislocated but it's not that's just because we have that fibrocartilage disc it's soft tissue so x-rays just shoot right through it okay and then uh, the radius it forms the wrist joint with the scaphoid the lunate and the triquetrum and so here's the articulation for the scaphoid and here's the articulation um, for the lunate and we'll be learning all those different uh, names in a little while. Now there's also a styloid process on the radius as well. A little hard to see here. Let's take a look at this picture right there, this bump. Okay, and you can feel that on your own wrist. Um, that is the styloid process of the radius. Okay. All right, now going into the hands, and I, and I skipped the carpals for a moment here because there's a lot more of those to learn. 
So let's look at uh, the palm of the hand first. Palm of the hand has metacarpals in there. There's going to be five total. And um, the first is proximal to the thumb. And that's the way we count these. We start with the thumb. And this is going to be one, two, three, four, five. That's important because clinically, if you're going to talk about a certain carpal, you want to be able to number it. Okay, same thing with phalanges. Um, believe it or not, the thumb is number one. The index finger is number two, the middle finger is three, ring finger four, little finger five. Okay, so, you know, when you go to like your, your favorite game, you know, maybe a football game or something, and, and everybody's holding up a, a foam finger saying we're number one, uh, nope, the thumb is number one. They're holding up the index finger. That means number two. So really you're telling your team that uh, you're number two. It's okay. You know, but we're number two. No, no, no. See, when you go to a game, you need to hold up a, th a foam thumb. That's number one. Okay. Anyway, so going back to uh, the metacarpals. So there is the round part of the metacarpal, and that's going to be the head. Then there's the shaft, and then this flat area here is the base. Okay, a little easier to see on the larger one here. The head, the shaft, the base. Okay, and then it's going to form, remember the MCP, the metacarpal phalangeal joints? Those are right there. So the MCPs. The phalanges, now there's 14 total phalanges, and each is called a phalanx. So a phalanx is a finger. And there's going to be a proximal, a middle, and a distal. So here is our proximal phalanx, middle phalanx, distal phalanx. Okay, proximal, middle, distal. What's this? Middle. What's this? Proximal. What's this? Distal. What's this? Distal. What's this? Uh, if you said middle, that's wrong. Thumb doesn't have a middle. Thumb has a distal and a proximal. Okay. So a distal and a proximal. And the same thing with the metacarpals. It uh, has a head a shaft and a base so again head shaft base okay also the thumb has its own name and that's pretty important the thumb has its own name it's called pollux okay let's talk about the eight carpal bones in the wrist we have a proximal row and we have a distal row. Again, proximal, closer to the body, distal, farther away from the body. So proximal row, distal row. In the proximal row, the first bone is the scaphoid. Now, have you ever seen scaffolding? Okay, that kind of holds things up. You know, painters use them. Sometimes they're used in construction. So I think of the scaphoid as as scaffolding holding up your thumb. Okay, well, pretend like your hand is up in the air. So, with your fingers pointing upward. So then the scaphoid would be holding up your thumb. Okay, so it's kind of boat shaped. The thing about the scaphoid is that it gets narrow in the center. To me, instead of boat shaped, well, it is, it is boat shaped depending on how you hold it. Uh, another way you might hold it, it would be kind of dumbbell shaped. Okay, but anyway, right in the middle there, where it kind of pinches together a little bit, that is the area most likely to fracture if you fall and put your hand out, you know, to break the fall. The carpal bone most likely to break is the scaphoid, and it will snap in half right at that little neck of the scaphoid. 
The dangerous thing about that is there's only one blood vessel that goes through that scaphoid. So if you snap that scaphoid in half, and if you don't get a hand surgeon to work on that hand and reestablish that blood supply, and even if you do, it's no guarantee, um, but um, you may lose blood to part of that scaphoid. And what happens when bone dies, it gets reabsorbed by the body. So I have had patients where, you know, they've come to me with hand pain. I've shot an x-ray and they're missing a scaphoid. Well, they probably had an injury, you know, when they were much younger, because I, I can think of one of my patients who was in their 80s, actually. And so when they were younger, they probably had an accident and, and hurt that, that scaphoid or broke it and didn't realize it. And um, over time, you know, it was absorbed by the body. And, you know, they're still, still able to use the hand and everything, but you're going to have a lot of instability. Grip's probably not going to be quite as strong. And, um, and there could be pain there as well. So that's the scaphoid. The next one is the lunate. It's called lunate because it looks like a crescent moon. Okay, so crescent moon shaped. Now, if you put your hand out and try to catch your fall and nothing breaks, the lunate is the bone most likely to dislocate. Okay, so, and I'm talking in the wrist again. So the bone in the wrist most likely to dislocate lunate, bone most likely to fracture in the wrist, scaphoid. The triquetrum uh, just means three corners. Tri is three. Okay, so three corners. And so scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum. And then we have this little P-shaped bone called the pisiform. Some people pronounce it pisiform, and that's correct as well. So pisiform or pisiform. I just call it pisiform. Okay. So that's the proximal row. Scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform. Distal row, we're going to go back and start at the thumb again. Okay, notice I started at the thumb for the proximal row. Then we ding, go right back to the front, just like those old typewriters, right? Um, we start a new line. We start back at the beginning. So we're going to start here at the beginning at the thumb again. And the thumb is the trapezium and it's four-sided next to it is the trapezoid that's also four-sided uh, okay that's a little confusing trapezium and trapezoid they both sound a lot alike um how are we going to remember that well think about your thumb swinging on a trapeze so the thumb swings on the trapezium. Okay. So hopefully that'll help you remember that the first bone in the distal row is going to be the trapezium with the thumb swinging on it. Okay. Next is the trapezoid. Then the next one here has a round head on it. And what's head again? Caput, right? So this is the capitate. And so the next bone is called the hamate. And so here's the hamate right here. So the hamate, and the hamate's going to have a little hook on it. So what are we going to call that hook? Well, the hook of the hamate. Okay. Now there is a ligament that goes across um, this, these carpals. And it's going to form a little tunnel underneath. Okay, we call that the transverse carpal ligament or the flexor retinaculum. And again, it's going to give a tunnel. And that's what we call the carpal tunnel. Now, there is another tunnel that you might not have heard of. And it's a tunnel between the pisiform and the hook of the hamate. And that is called the tunnel of Guillaume. Tunnel of Guillaume. And so it could be a little difficult to try to memorize all of these carpals in order. And so I made up a mnemonic to help you memorize these. 
Also, I made up a little animation to show you as well. So I hope this helps. Welcome to Learning the Carpals of the Hand. And I'm your host, Dr. Jerry McNally. The wrist contains eight carpal bones, and these bones are considered short bones. To name them, we're going to start at the proximal row on the thumb side. And that's right here, uh, closest to the radius. But first, we're going to need a mnemonic to help us remember these names. Hmm, I wonder if this pepper is hot. Yikes, I guess some ladies try peppers that they can't handle. And so our mnemonic is, some ladies try peppers that they can't handle. And so this is a left palm, and here's the thumb. Taking a look at the proximal row of carpals, We have the S for sum, and that's for the scaphoid. The L for ladies is the lunate. The T for tri, well, let's just finish the word, triquitrum. And the P for peppers is the pisiform. Looking at the distal row, the first T for that is for the trapezium. The second T for they is for the trapezoid. The C for can't is for capitate. And the H for handle is hammied. I hope this helps. One problem that we have in the distal row of carpals is that there are two T's, the trapezium and the trapezoid. And well, I, I prepared a little cartoon to maybe help you tell the two apart. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare to be amazed as I perform an amazing feat, which is a big deal since I'm a thumb. <laughs> Get it? Thumb, feet? Uh, never mind. Anyway, this for the first time, a thumb will swing on a trapeze. I think I'm gonna need a hand. <laughs> oh, I think I broke a nail. And so don't forget that the thumb swings on the trapezium. Well, I hope that helps. And don't forget to practice, practice, practice. That's the only way you're gonna learn anatomy and physiology. So, hope this helped, and best of success. <laughs>